I was born in a small village called Bor in South Sudan. We knew Africa had its troubles, but we had food and we had each other until one day, the spring after I graduated from high school, I was in the market getting meat for my family. Baskets were raised and people were shouting. The meat wouldn't go far. Over the noise and chaos, the unmistakable sound of gunfire filled the air. Some people dropped to the ground and some people ran. I chose to run. My stepmother and I grabbed what we could and ran into the jungle and on to another village. It would be 11 years until I stopped running from that war. I never know peace in Africa again. Later, after I was married to a cage and pregnant with our first baby girl, we knew we weren't safe. He was a teacher, and educators and the educated were targets of the government. He needed to join the rebels. I was with my parents when a tongue was born. She was beautiful, a symbol of hope. We were hungry and scared. My parents decided that I would take my 12-year-old sister, Adol, and my baby and leave with thousands of others migrating to Ethiopia, 200 miles to the east. We walked from May to June, living on leaves and whatever we could find along the way to eat. We arrived at the UN camp, hungry, tired, and scared. By a miracle, my husband was there. We were both shocked and numb. He looked at our child for the first time, and even though she was a girl, he wasn't disappointed. <laughs> we lived there six years of feeling safe, fat, and believing that life was under control. Our family grew. By 1991, Atong was five. I had another daughter, a daughter who was then three, a son, Hood, who was almost two. I was pregnant with my fourth child. We also were caring for my three young siblings. But in 1991, I found myself running again, pregnant, and six children in my care, and a husband I had to leave behind. The war had found us in Ethiopia. This next journey back to Sudan was to test everything I knew about hope and strength. Traveling with the little one was difficult. My youngest daughter held my skirt and my brother carried the baby. One day, shots rang out, and thousands of refugees ran for their lives. My daughter and my brother, and my entire family were missing. I was blind with panic. I begged for help, but everyone was searching for their families. Everyone was scared. The war was on us. If I didn't move, I would, be, I would be killed. I willed my feet to move. As we ran, we came to the river, a very dangerous place because you can easily fall into the large holes the elephants make in the bottom and drown in the current. My belly was huge, with two hands on the rations on my head. I crossed the riverbed, searching with my toes for danger. Each step was for my youngest daughter and my infant son. I missed the step and plunged into the hole, sinking quickly down to my neck. I was trapped by nature, my unborn child, and the precious bundle on my head. I watched in despair as other children were drowning around me. 
I scanned the opposite bank for anyone I knew, anyone who I had entrusted with my children's lives. Guns were blaring in the background and people were running. Reality had become so dark, it blocked out the African sun. I prayed. I witnessed the horror of the battle between nature, man, and raw evil. Still, I clung to the hope that I would be chosen to live that day. My children needed me. I was injured but managed to limp to the other side. Thousands of people were calling for their loved ones. Panic was everywhere, and it continued throughout the night. I finally found my children. We would be moving together as family. I had hope, but that hope was challenged very quickly. Word soon came that all of those who stayed behind are dead. My husband had died. Fighting for his family and his people, I needed to grieve but couldn't. There was nothing left to do but stumble forward. Our spirits were broken. We were hungry. We battled nature, hunger, bullets, sickness. We walked from May until July. I was now seven months pregnant. One day I was getting water from the river when I saw a dead body and then more and more floating down the current. They floated past me face down. I was in the water desperately searching face after face. All I was thinking was my husband. I could not keep up with all the dead. I tried to go on, but it was too much. I sank to the bank and cried. My tears were for all the dead and all still living and my pain. I cried for what I didn't understand. I looked at the wasted lives flowing down the river and wondered who could save us. Then I knew it was up to me to save my children. I gathered what strength I had left and filled my container with water and went back to my children. Behind us was no mercy. Ahead was the only hope. Caring for my three children and my three siblings in these conditions was difficult, and we all focused on keeping them safe. All six were tied up under the net so they could sleep. Each night, I would pray and sing to them. Hallelujah, hallelujah, anamashi lebeta bui. My daughter Edward was very sick. My tears fell like rain. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Anamashi le beta bui. I knew the baby in my belly would come soon, and I was scared for him and for all of us. I was desperate. I needed to find any hospital where I could volunteer and hope for medical help. I was very worried about my daughter's health. I decided. I head, I head back home, but I had to leave my brothers and sisters, cousins and family. The crowded hut of my cousin kept us safe, but provided little else. There was nothing left in this village. 
I held my sick child on my lap, stroking her hair, not sure what will come next. Two days later, my contraction started. I gave birth to a beautiful, healthy baby boy, Jock, but nearly lost my own life. As the doctor wasn't there, I bled so badly. Later, I took my sick daughter to the doctor. He gave us some medicine, a bar of soap, and a cooking oil, and a blanket, and he ordered some more medicine. Small tokens of comfort held incredible power in such despair. But the rest of the medicine never came. I prayed and prayed. I knew that God was keeping us alive for a reason. I prayed for my daughter's life who was increasingly sick. One night in December, she cried out. I knew that was the end of my child's life and I blamed myself because I was her mother and I supposed to be able to care for my children. By the end of that very day, she was gone. That was the saddest day of my life. We buried my small daughter's body under the cover of night in the neighboring tribe's land. My friend Deborah was there, reminding me that I was a daughter of God and a strong woman. We prayed for my husband, my daughter, and my family. The darkness surrounded me inside and out. I wanted to give up. We headed to Kenya. I would do what it took to make it to safety. For the baby jock and for the memories of my sweet adored. It took me three years to get to America. In May of 1994, I stepped off of the plane in Portland, Maine with four children and a small collection of papers and the clothing on our backs. America was so bright. It hurt my eyes. I'm telling you this story not to make you sad, but to fill you with hope. We made it. We hoped when all hope was lost. Last spring, my daughter, my firstborn graduated from law school. <laughs> and my jock, the one I carry in my belly across the river, received his diploma from high school. My children are smart and good and healthy. They will make a difference and will be happy contributing members of our new country. Thank you. I hope you gather strength for your challenges through my story, that you find hope in the darkness and power in your sense of family and community. My story needs to be told to honor the thousands of refugees who did not survive the wars. My lullaby song prayer for them can carry their light forward into the hopes and dreams of the children of the war. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
ana mashi le beta bui hallelu haleluya haleluya ana mashi le beta bui thank you